Hello, everybody. Welcome to the training, learning, and development community. Thanks for joining us today. Um, really glad to have our guest today, Bello Miguel Cipriani, who is uh, somebody that Star Peterson introduced me to. Um, just, uh, I guess it's been a couple months now, and I had the pleasure of speaking with Bello uh, by phone a while ago. It was an excellent conversation. I am just, uh, I'm honored to have him on the broadcast. Really, really interesting. He's an author, uh, educator, uh, technologist, formerly a journalist over at, was it the, at the San Francisco Chronicle, um, you know, Bay Area resident. And um, today we're going to be talking about um, practicing and understanding digital inclusion. I've got a group of questions that um, folks that are live in chat can um can add to if you want that's in the bottom of the screen and we're going to be going through this stuff with Bello. Um, and before I get going, let me just give a shout out to some of the live folks that are in. Christiana's here. Quetzal is here. Um, instructional design lady. Oh, I can't remember your name, but I know that you've emailed me in the past. Molly, it's good to see you. Nick is here. Thanks for joining us. Why don't you go ahead and just introduce yourself to our audience and, and, and let us know who you are. Thank you, Louise. Well, first, I want to say that I'm I'm very excited to be here. I'm, I'm a listener, and um, you know, as a longtime listener, I, I um, I've noticed that a lot of people in the L and D field just have very um, colorful backgrounds. They have many careers, and I think that's I'm no exception. Um, I uh, began my career in. Um, high tech as a Unix systems administrator, then worked into management, IT management, and did all kinds of jobs until back in 2007 um, when uh, I was assaulted um, uh, by a group of men in San Francisco, and that's how I lost my sight. And so I went from being uh, able bodied to being completely blind uh, rather quickly. And so um, here I was in this new world um, living in, you know, in Silicon Valley, but still struggling to to gain accessibility, and so that really started my, my journey into, you know, what I call the the digital inclusion field, where I started off, you know, troubleshooting, trying to fix my own uh, problems, access problems as an employee, um, as an artist, as a, as a writer, and eventually made it my my made my the decision to become a scholar in the field and got my doctorate in education and that's where I'm now where I'm focused uh, through my consulting practice on helping people not just understand digital inclusion but you know make sure that they're um, able to practice it to their best ability. I love it. Thank you so much. So um, when exactly did your accessibility journey begin? Was it something that, you know, after that, um, after um, the tragedy that after you lost your sight, was it, uh, did it take a while before you're like, wait a minute, I really need to change things up here and, and just figure out like a, a better way to be able to 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 continue to use the computer and 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 technology i mean was it something immediate that that you really acted on or or was it something that you had to kind of consider for a while there is definitely an assimilation period to the assistive technology so i am completely blind i have no light perception everything's pitch black for me. And so I'm dependent on several technologies. Um, I've been through different uh, versions of different um, forms of um, devices and apps. And But, you know, the one that I've been using the longest is called a screen reader. And for uh, many uh, individuals, you know, educators who are <laughs> creating content these days are probably becoming more familiar with the term of a screen reader user. And so um, learning to understand the screen reader voice took a while. Um, I would say it took me a good year to get comfortable with understanding, you know, the, the phonics voice, that, um, that very robotic speech that, you know, um, for those of you who remember those old speak and spill toys, <laughs> it sounds a lot like those. Um, and so, yeah, it was a, a year of just getting used to the technology, um, helping my ear adapt to the noises, the sounds, um, and uh, it was, you know, just getting that under my belt that really led me to realize um, that, hey, I, I learned how to use this software really well. 
and sometimes it doesn't work because I'm not using the, the software correctly. It doesn't work because whoever designed this digital property, you know, website, app, you know, document uh, didn't include these things that I need for my software to work. And that's really what led my 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 research and my interest in helping people understand, you know, what they could do to help me be more successful. Wow. Okay. And and so and you were actually after you lost your sight, you that's when you became a journalist, right? For the San Francisco Chronicle. I did. Yeah, I had a column with them for a while. I was as always a a radio correspondent uh, for the Ed Bacta show in San Francisco, and so um, I was in the space where I was, you know, working in high tech. I kept having problems with accessibility. Um, you know. Uh, employers had a hard time customizing or making changes to the tools they were using. So my screen reader could work, you know, often they were third party um, vendor tools that they couldn't, you know, um, they couldn't modify in any way. So I couldn't produce and I went through a lot of jobs. I went through like, I think within like a two year period, I had like nine jobs and, you know, I had recently been blind. So I had a really good resume working, you know, in many top companies in Silicon Valley. So I was getting jobs. I just couldn't keep them because I kept running into issues with, you know, workflow products, with tools they were using to communicate with even, you know, even like uh, reporting my time card was an issue at one point where I couldn't do that because of the, um, the payroll system they're using couldn't be accessed with my screen meter. And so I did say to myself, you know what, maybe this is a, an opportunity for me to, you know, <laughs> change what I'm doing. Maybe, you know, I, this is a need. Maybe I could, you know, be the, the voice of the people and, met, um, you know, jumped into writing and journalism and my career picked up for a while. But then again, that, you know, um, inaccessibility foe creep back up when I start, started facing access problems, you know, in journalism as I, started to, you know, the expectation became that I needed to do social media and do videos and, you know, and do slideshows, right? And that really um, hindered my ability to, to stay in that field. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. I have a really wonderful question here that was kind of, uh, you know, along the same lines of what I was thinking from Nick Floro um, that I'd like to, um, to, to ask you. What technology or assistance has worked best for you to date? And what is the feature or function you'd want to be improved? I think that, you know, the, the tool I use the most is a screen reader, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's a mobile screen reader on, on my iPhone or on a desktop, um, I'm most relying on that. That's what gives me, you know, the most independence. And so having, you know, websites, documents and apps that, you know, um, you know, have defined headings and, you know, use all text and have, you know, uh, properly labeled elements are, you know, are crucial for me. But I would say that definitely, you know, screen readers um, have been over the last, you know, 15 years that I've been blind, uh, the most powerful tool because that's, you know, that's what I use for banking. That's, you know, how I went to, how, how I got my doctorate degree was through online classes. And so definitely screen readers, um, you know, um, are the key. I, I would say that I'm I'm happy that things have really improved even within, you know, my 15 years of being blind. When I first lost my sight, I was still using, you know, um, cassette recorders <laughs> to wow. to take notes, you know. And so just, you know, that space I went from using digital recorders to now I'm using apps on my phone. So, you know, technology has has definitely improved. But I would say that screen readers are like the biggest, you know, the, the most important tool in, in my toolkit. Yeah, I love it. So Bello, you know, we we're talking about this in the green room. Can you just show us how you use your screen reader? Just, just so we can just get a view of, you know, someone, um, you know, who is blind, who has to use like, you know, your, your iPhone. I just would love it if the audience can just sort of experience like what, what, you know, how you interface with it. Oh, absolutely. So uh, let me, um, I'll grab my phone here. And I think I had turned it off. Turn voiceover on. Okay, I've turned voiceover on. So I'm using the built-in um, screen reader on the iPhone, which is, you know, as you guys heard, it's called voiceover. And, you know, um, it's, you know, Apple products, you know, they're just, 
they're accessible to me pretty much off the shelf. They've done an amazing job with, with accessibility. And so now that the voiceover is on, I'm just gliding my thumb over the, the screen and it's saying camera. Something I wanna note is that people who are blind and, and use assistive technology can often teach themselves to hear faster. Um, that is called verbosity, which is the speed of speech. And I had to take classes and get myself to that level. So I set my my verbosity pretty high because I like to you know listen really fast. But I'm gonna slow it down, and um, it's at eighty five percent. I'm gonna slow it down. So I have it at ten percent. So everyone here uh, on the cast could hear um, what I'm experiencing uh, a little better. So let's see. Flashlight. That's the flashlight. Off. It's telling me it's off. Camera. Bump. Camera. Let me get to my. Fifteen percent. So there's my text messages, calendar, calendar photos, photos, camera, camera weather, weather, clock, maps, It's telling me I just got it one I have one on read email. Don't so it's pretty much how I, I, I navigate most technology. I try to, you know, first jump on my phone um, and just to see if it's accessible or not. And then, you know, maybe go on the computer. You know, I also have an Apple Watch. Um, I feel like I'm a spokesperson for Apple here, but, <laughs> you know, they just do so, such an amazing job. And, you know, I also, I should, I should say that, you know, Microsoft and, and, you know, Google, um, have actually stepped up and are, are doing a lot for accessibility. But, you know, that's something that within my research, you know, it's companies, large companies, because they have the resources, you know, hiring the professionals, doing the research, you know, um, it's easy for them, you know, where, where people really need to help or, you know, freelancers, small business owners, where they think about accessibility and it's all so overwhelming. No, absolutely. I, I totally agree. And I even face that challenge myself. You know, it's like, where do I even start? And um, and I am just so thankful for the opportunity to be able to talk to you about this and also for your generosity and like sort of just showing us how you how you interface with a device. I think that was tremendously educational for me. So so I really appreciate that. Now, I want to talk about um you know, the circumstances, why Star introduced me to you. And it's because you, she is working with you to build some courseware. Yes, we're, um, I'm putting my own, um, my own online a asynchronous courses together. And, you know, actually, uh, she was, I, I first heard, um, from star was uh, when she was a guest on your podcast so mm. you know again i'm a, <laughs> i'm a listener and so i just you know when i heard her 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 passion her voice for inclusion mm -hmm. you know that that felt like someone i would like to partner and you know see this into uh complete this project so uh i'm working on on a couple of things right now and one of those things is the, is my online academy where i want to you know uh present courses that really you know present all this you know, accessibility, compliance, and inclusion topics in, in bite size. You know, um, if I already just kind of make some generalizations about the content out there for accessibility, um, I think there's a couple of people providing this service, but a lot of it is really aimed at developers. You know, some of the courses that I've taken, it's like you need to know CSS, JavaScript, and HTML5 to even, you know, enroll for the course. And so, you know, my perspective is like, you know, um, I want to make accessibility training accessible. So, you know, take a step back and really showing people how to use the tools on the on the products they're using. There's very simple things that they could do, you know, how to write all, um, you know, alt text that works, you know, and, you know, that's the project that I'm working on now and I'm hoping that it'll go live in the summer. 
No, I love it. And I'm very excited. I can't wait to see see what you're going to release. I think that it's going to be tremendously um, useful. Um, so with this audience of instructional designers, is where would you suggest that they start if, if they're interested in improving you know, their accessibility strategies or their digital inclusion strategies? I think, you know, something to to keep in mind is that you know um i i i was an instructional designer right and so when i went into instructional design you know being blind i knew that i would never be the best graphic artist <laughs> you know i knew whenever those projects came up i would have to outsource partner with somebody else and i had my list of people to partner with right um i think that accessibility is another component where you know, whether you're a freelancer, you work for a small company or a large company, um, it's something to consider is, do I have the time to become an accessibility professional? You know, how long will that take? Or should I just partner with somebody? Um, you know, accessibility is a field in its own right. You know, we have our conferences, our certificates. Um, you know, I have, I have my doctorate in digital inclusion, right? And so um, it's just like any other field, whether it's accounting or, or even, you know, um, the culinary arts, right? I would cater a party if there's five people are coming, it, you know, there's a hundred guests, I'm calling a catering company, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and so those are things that I encourage, you know, instructional designers to really look at, you know, long-term is do they want to get some skills and um, really build that skill up or do they just wanna work with a partner, you know, and, you know, uh, figure out who that may be. Oh, that's a great suggestion. I, I was sort of not really expecting that, but you're right. The whole, you know, accessibility is like pretty much a field unto itself. And it's, it, it does feel like it's a struggle just trying to be able to, you know, like pick up this whole other skill set and integrate it into your own. And, 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 you know, so I can see how it would probably make more sense to find you know, somebody that is more of an expert in that and bring on, bring them on. But just to get working knowledge and, and, and just understanding stuff, like say in your daily things, like I know for what I do for O'Reilly Media, um, you know, all text is something that I watch out for regularly because I do some um, development and messaging and, and you know, and on, on, on different areas. Um, all text is something to always watch out for. Are there other things that, you know, that, that, that you know of that would be important that you'd like for people like me to keep in mind when we're, um, you know, building our, our projects, if, it, if it's, if it's, you know, graphics or instructional design um, 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 concepts, is there anything in, in particular that you think is important? I say that the, the two, there's two things that I want to cover here real quick. One is, um, you know, understanding the, you know, the accessibility features in the tools you use regularly, right? Mm. So if you're using, you know, Moodle or Canvas, or if you're using any other type of tool on a regular basis, understanding is, does this offer accessibility? Why or why not? You know, sometimes um, it's been my experience that some very progressive vendors have added accessibility features because their clients asked for it. You know, so really having that consciousness of asking, okay, is these tools that I use, do they have built-in features? You know, and if so, how do I learn to, you know, how do I learn to use them? Kind of start with what you have, right? Um, the other thing would be is to um, be mindful of um, not relying too much on automated tools uh, for accessibility checker from, a, um, a compliance perspective and the reason for that is that you know these um a lot of these you know uh overlays or accessibility checkers are just you know don't are not able to capture what i call the representative range meaning there isn't one type of you know um disabled user there's a range you know uh, there's novice users there's you know uh, pretty advanced users and you know, uh, those tools cannot capture that. And so, you know, if you're able to um, get real testers feedback, just like with any product, you'll end up with a, a better quality, you know, server slash product. Nice. No, that did. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that, that all makes perfect sense. Um, 
Yeah. In fact, after this call, I'm probably going to test out um, all my uh, accessibility features on my on my phone and on my iMac. I'm gonna on my MacBook. I'm, I de definitely want to test that out. And I don't know why I'd never really thought about that before. It might be just as simple as like, you know, um, you know, just turning some of these things on. So, um, yeah, I'm definitely gonna get into that. Um, you've had to have seen some success, right? Like with 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 your strategies for d digital inclusion and its success accessibility. Um, do you have any examples of, of things that you've seen that have worked that you've offered to like other organizations or individuals? You know, um, when I first started my consulting practice, um, even I'll, I'll take a step back when I was, you know, doing my doctoral research and I would tell people that my dissertation was on digital inclusion, they often laughed. It's like, what, what the heck is that? Or really, is that a thing? You know, and now, you know, post COVID people are realizing that it, it is a thing, right? And so um, the, reason, the reason I preface that is that, you know, um, when it comes to, you know, inclusion, like, again, it's because technology, you know, is always changing. So are the accessibility and inclusion approaches, right? And so I often, you know, get clients who say, hey, I took a alt text class, you know, in 2015. And, you know, it's, I don't know why things are not working. People aren't saying that it, it's not working the way it should be and so and so and so. And so then I say, well, you know, the web has changed a lot since 2015, right? Um, and so it's important to understand that don't have the expectation that accessibility is something you just do once. Again, it's, you know, something that's an ongoing thing. And as technology changes, it will change. So just to, you know, give you guys a, you know, quick preview, you know, like many of <laughs> many uh, LD, uh, LD staff here, um, you know, I, I have a lot of NDAs that I, you know, hide my work, right? Um, and so what I could say is that I'll have clients that are doing, you know, accessibility from, a virtual reality perspective. You know, there's uh, clients developing, you know, courses uh, for the medical field or for business people. Uh, there was a course in ethics that I had to help make accessible and it's a virtual reality course. Hmm. And so um, accessibility is moving towards that way and there is a way of, of doing that. And so I would just, you know, let people know that accessibility is something that, you know, um, it, that's why it's important to make that decision, right? Am I gonna, grow the skill set or am I going to work with with, with uh, consultants because it's consistently changing as you know the tools we use change excellent you know I'm I'm just thinking you know because something that I'm working more with in fact you know I'm in the boot camp right now using JavaScript and and it is like really focused on building things within the browser that are automated and but when I reflect on it, it doesn't seem like some of the things that we're doing are very accessible. Like if you're just building things, you know, with JavaScript, is it better to sort of like avoid, like for somebody like me, should I like try to stay away from building sort of automated um, sort of flows of things that, that aren't accessible? Or would it be better? Well, that's what I'm thinking is that I should prioritize accessibility um, over everything else. That should be um, the number one thing that I look at versus creating things that are really, you know, that, that, that might look really pretty or, um, you know, uh, potentially um, might even be usable to, to people. But if, if it's not accessible, it's just not, you know, as important, it, 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 it shouldn't be the priority. I, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time trying to decide. No, that's, yeah, no yeah. you know, so I, I, we're, we're communicating telepathically because I, I know what you're getting at. And so yeah. uh, what I want to say is that, um, and I, I work with a lot of, you know, instructional designers, you know, we, through OLED Media, offer a help desk um, service where, you know, they buy a couple hours per month or, or, or a bulk hour, and then we answer their questions. So most of our clients, you know, when I launched that service, I thought we were going to get a lot of, you know, engineering companies, tech companies, and it's actually been a lot of teachers, um, instructional designers, and content creators, because they're always checking before they start something. Because it's, you know, it's what a waste of time to spend, you know, hours doing something and to have it not be accessible. And right. 
you know, so I think starting with accessibility right at the beginning, selecting the right tools, selecting the right, you know, partners, vendors is crucial. You know, there are there are certain tools that are are better for certain things. You know, um, what I you know want to just make sure I I am clear about is that with um, accessibility, it is always better, cheaper, and more efficient to start thinking about accessibility right at the beginning. So, for instance, you know, say that you know um, you're gonna say you're telling me that you're gonna launch. You know, you want to use, a, you're going to do an event training in, you know, May, right, for Mother's Day, right? And the first thing I'm going to say, well, what tools are you going to use? Then you'll tell me the tools you're going to use. Have you checked this level of access accessibility? And you would say no, so then I would do that for you. But the reason, you know, um, I bring that as, as a, just as a step is that it saves so much time. You cannot imagine, you know, how the disappointment that I hear in people when they say you, you use something that's not going to work. Yeah. And I'm sorry you spent 30, 40 hours, sometimes years on something. Yeah. Um, and that that's the key start at the beginning. And accessibility is really usability, right? And so, of mm -hmm. course, you know, an example that I, I often bring up in my lectures is that, you know, think about the, the automatic doors at grocery stores, right? Those were, you know... Um, created with to help people who have mobility you know uh, issues who may be using a wheelchair or a walker right however who hasn't benefited from those i mean i do and i wasn't mm -hmm. the intended user right and so the same thing with accessibility you know just some some quick facts is that um you know uh captions closed captioning improves comprehension by like 75 percent mm -hmm. You know, it's very helpful for English learners who, you know, may not understand how something's pronounced, but may may see the spelling and can then reference it, go look it up later, mm -hmm. right? Um, all text, really uh, effective alt text is actually really good for searchability. If mm -hmm. you have good, good alt text, your images, you know, show up in um, in image searches because mm -hmm. it's connected to, to a topic, right? And so, um, you know, accessibility, often makes your content stronger because it's more usable. Yeah, that is a, a great point. And it's sort of, you know, trying to 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 clear up the 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 mud in my head about what I was trying to express, but you know, I'm going through building out these JavaScript things that are really really powerful, you know, just visual things that are that are really interesting, movement, different things like that. But ultimately, kind of complex and just not actually that usable to begin with right it's just like it's it, it's got a lot of bling to it but when it comes down to it i personally just favor very simple um interfaces websites things like that and you know as much as 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 i'm enjoying learning how to do javascript i'm probably not going to use most of what i'm learning um you know, maybe just more for 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 back end types of things. So, I, I do think the usability piece is is is, is so key. Um, like you were saying, um, I've got a great um, sort of comment here and question from Christina Pringy. Um, Christina is asking. It sounds like accessibility, like DEI, is more of a process that needs to be built upon, not just the box to be checked. How can we create the systemic change? needed to move the needle on accessibility? That is such a beautiful question. And thank you so much for, for bringing it up. So how I differentiate myself, because again, this accessibility is an industry and you know you, you could now Google accessibility consultants and you could get you know many, many options. But you know, my approach is not, you know, to step away from the checkbox mentality, right? Um, and I'll just say that, you know, like Section 508 of the ADA, you know, it's wonderful. It's giving people like me rights, but some of the technical requirements are a little outdated. They're like from two, from 2008, and you know, they don't take into account like you know the cloud and you know other tools that we're now using. And so, you know, what I always tell organizations is even you know meeting local policy, you know, because I work with clients in, in other countries, meeting local policy doesn't guarantee the best inclusive experience. That's something that you have to operationalize and you do that with ongoing training, right? And so with some of my clients, you know, what does that mean? So I have clients that are, you know, magazines, um, 
popular blogs, you know, podcasts and so on, they're producing a lot of content. So I'm creating training for them every three months because, you know, they need it. Uh, but the organizations that, you know, need something once a year, right? That's something that leadership management need to take into consideration is, you know, what tools are we using? How often are they changing? And how often should we bring, you know, someone to work with us? Or is it, you know, worth us having um, our own accessibility consultant in-house because there's that much of a need? Very nice. So, Bello, tell me something. What if if there are, you know, educators in, in, in this community, in TLDC, instructional designers that want to keep accessibility a priority or top of mind as far as conversations or resources, things like that. Is there anywhere in particular that you would suggest that we can go to? You know, um, I always recommend people to check out the, um, you know, the WCAG um, um, web content accessibility guidelines. You know, there's, um, couple blogs that talk give information about them they're a little robust they're very robust so for some people it might be you know um a little too much to kind of take in um i offer a service if you go to oletmedia.com i have what's called the the digital inclusion quarterly newsletter so every quarter i send out free videos articles and content for people to, to you know um to read over um there's a woman named um, Lainey Feingold, who's an attorney in San Francisco. She has a, a great resource blog. Um, you know, what I'm seeing now is that um, the, you know, even though accessibility, it's an industry in its own right, I would say that it's still in its infancy. You know, 10 years ago, I don't think we existed. <laughs> and so uh, free resources, um, I think that there's about a handful, but I think the ones that I mentioned would be a good place to start. Excellent, excellent. And I did paste uh, a link to Ola Media in the chat area. And um, and I'm gonna go ahead and start to wrap things up, but um, Bello, you were so interesting. I mean, it's not often that I'll meet somebody that you know is, is a teacher, author, um, you've got your own media company. You've got your own book publish, book publishing company. Um, all of these amazing things that you've done. You've got a PhD. Um, tell us, uh, like, when did you? Have you always been this productive? Like, accomplishing all of this? I, I was, you know, I want to get your book about um, your experiences um, prior to your blindness. And, and I forget, it was kind of more of an autobiography. I'm, I'm really interested in, 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 in reading that. And, you know, I was really taken by how you said you used to look up at the Adobe building in San Jose and it was kind of a, uh, um, you know, something that you were aspiring to. But, you know, what, ins what, ins what continues to inspire you? How do you um, manage to keep doing all of this incredible work? I think things really change for me when I stop trying to control things. You know, not just in my personal life, but at work, wanting things to be, you know, a certain way instead of letting things happen organically, right? And so I really, my approach has really been about, you know, um, being adaptable uh, and being able to pivot. And, um, it, you know, I, I sit here saying, you know, talking about it like it's easy. It's something that I'm, I'm working on, you know, every day. And there are certain projects that I had to say, you know, this has to be put on the shelf for now. Um, one of those actually was my own podcast. You know, I, I, we had a very good year and we were doing well, but just my availability was, you know, um, I couldn't give it the attention I wanted. So that's something that I had to say, you know, I, I can't do it all. I got to put this on the shelf and it doesn't mean I'll never do it again, but, you know, I had to put that away and, and focus on, on other things. So I think that that's something that for me, you know, understanding having a very clear action list and not being obsessed with, you know, the outcome. Nice. Very nice. And you're in, you're in Minnesota now, right? Yeah. I'm in Minneapolis. I've been here for, um, six, seven years, seven years now. So it's, um, 
it's been a, a quite the transition, but my, my family's from here. I'm originally from the San Francisco Bay Area, but I have a lot of family out here. So, you know, as I got older, being our own family just became more important. Sure. Absolutely. All right. Well, Bello, thank you so much. I, you know, if you ever want to do another guest appearance, anything you want to talk about, showcase, you know, some of your courseware, anything like that please come back. I would love to have you on the broadcast again. Uh, this has been an incredible opportunity just to spend some time with you and um, yeah, looking forward to seeing more of your projects. Thank you. Yeah. And everybody, if you, you know, at that olebmedia.com website, um, I think, what is it? You can subscribe there. Yeah. It's right at the bottom for the quarterly newsletter, sign up, um, stay in touch with, with Bello and um, that's it. Hope to see you again sometime soon, Bello. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, everybody. Um, next week, don't forget to sign up for the Women of L&D Conference, which is happening on the 17th and 18th of March. That one is great. Um, it's If you go to thetldc.com, you'll see a link to, um, to the landing page for it. It's a free event. So please sign up. We've already got a few hundred people signed up for that one. And uh, that takes place next week. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and close out the broadcast. Um, thanks again, Bello. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.